May 31, 2006, Swedish police raided data centers across Stockholm targeting the Pirate Bay, the world's biggest piracy site. Around 65 officers executed coordinated warrants across multiple sites. They confiscated servers, routers, and equipment belonging to the Pirate Bay and its internet provider. Politicians promised the piracy problem was solved. Entertainment executives celebrated. The platform went offline around 11 in the morning. Authorities thought they'd won. They hadn't. One of the architects who made the impossible comeback possible was a Swedish hacker with the handle Anakata. His real name was Gottfried Svartholm. He was 21 years old, had long dark hair, wire-rimmed glasses, and a philosophy that information wanted to be free. He understood something governments didn't see coming. The platform returned, not just once, but repeatedly over the next two decades. When the Pirate Bay reappeared, it proved something authorities feared. Digital infrastructure could be built to resist coordinated attacks. The architecture would inspire dozens of copycat sites worldwide. While competitors like Mininova and ISOHunt eventually fell, the Pirate Bay's model survived. By January 2025, that survival matters more than ever. Netflix costs $23 monthly, Disney Plus $14, Max 16. Watching everything legally costs over $100 monthly. With rising costs, piracy surged dramatically. Telegram channels distribute movies hours after release. Streaming rippers pulled directly from services. Authorities shut down one site and three more appear. Security researchers note how this resurgence demonstrates that the resilience techniques developed 22 years ago continue to challenge enforcement efforts. To understand how it came back, we need to go back to where it started. If you are enjoying this video, consider subscribing to Arxis to dive deep into the real stories behind the world's most notorious hackers. A like really helps the channel, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. 2003, Gottfried Swartholm was in his early 20s, living in Stockholm with friends Frederick Nye and Peter Sunday. They watched the entertainment industry destroy every file sharing service. Napster had centralized servers, so one lawsuit killed it. Kazaa used a central index, so authorities shut it down. Every piracy site had a single point of failure. Hit that point, and the system collapsed. Svartholm saw a different approach. BitTorrent technology had recently emerged. Instead of downloading from one source, BitTorrent let users download pieces from hundreds of computers at once. The more people downloaded, the faster it got. Every downloader became a distributor. He had an idea. Build a search engine for torrents, but never host the files. The site would index torrent files, tiny metadata files pointing to content on users' computers worldwide. No copyrighted material on the servers, just a searchable database. Legally gray, technically difficult to shut down. Working from his Stockholm apartment, Svartholm coded the architecture. As he later explained in the documentary TPB AFK, the idea was that if they take the servers, they take nothing. The actual content lived distributed across millions of computers. The Pirate Bay was just the map. The design solved what killed other piracy sites. If authorities raided servers, they'd find text files pointing elsewhere. Taking down the Pirate Bay would be like arresting library patrons because the library had a card catalog. The design that made him legendary would make him a target for law enforcement worldwide. Within months, the Pirate Bay became the internet's biggest piracy hub. Millions of users, thousands of new torrents daily. Movies appeared before theatrical release. TV shows uploaded minutes after broadcast. Peter Sunday handled public relations. Frederick Ney managed technical operations with Svartholm. Carl Lundstrom, a wealthy businessman, provided financial backing. His motivation was ideological, not financial. Server costs ran thousands monthly. Donations helped. Advertising covered the rest, though purists objected to ads on a free information site. Hollywood lost billions. They sent cease and desist letters. In one blog post, the Pirate Bay responded mockingly. We are non-profit and our servers are paid for by donations. If you want to help, please send us a positive message and some flowers. 
competitors existed, Mininova had more torrents, Isohunt had better search, but the Pirate Bay had something neither did, a defiant identity users rallied behind. Authorities faced international pressure to act, but the law was unclear. The platform didn't host files, just pointed to them. Was that illegal? Prosecutors weren't sure. Meanwhile, the infrastructure grew more sophisticated. Servers moved across countries using multiple hosting providers with systems designed to keep running if parts failed. What is documented is the site's remarkable resilience. Every attempt to locate and seize critical infrastructure seemed to fail. By 2006, investigators were building a case. But success brought attention, and attention brought enemies. The May 31st raid had seemed perfect, coordinated across multiple locations, comprehensive, every server confiscated. But Gottfried Svartholm and Frederick Ney had prepared for exactly this scenario. Critical data existed as encrypted backups in multiple countries. Within hours of the raid, new servers activated in the Netherlands. DNS records updated automatically. By evening, a message appeared on a backup domain. We'll be back shortly. June 3rd, 2006, approximately 72 hours after the raid, the Pirate Bay was fully operational. Same database, same torrents, only the server location had changed. Another blog post went up. Thanks for all the flowers and love you sent us. We're stronger than ever. Users flooded back. Traffic exploded beyond pre-raid levels. Many had never visited before, but heard about the shutdown. The failed raid became the best advertising possible. As one media account later noted, the operation was highly unsuccessful. Entertainment lawyers were stunned. They'd executed what they thought was a perfect raid, but the site returned stronger. The problem wasn't execution, it was architecture. The operators had built a system where physical servers were irrelevant. If authorities found one location, the data already existed elsewhere. This case would become one of the most significant in cybersecurity and copyright enforcement history, a case study in how digital infrastructure can be designed to resist centralized takedown attempts. Over the next three years, investigators tracked the site across Europe, Netherlands, Russia, other locations. Each time authorities located servers, they'd already migrated. International pressure intensified. The US Trade Representative listed Sweden as a piracy concern. Investigators documented every server relocation, building evidence for what would eventually become a criminal case. The cat and mouse game had only just begun. 2009. Swedish prosecutors charged Gottfried Swartholm, Frederick Ney, Peter Sunde, and Carl Lundström with assisting in copyright violations. The trial started in February 2009. Entertainment lawyers argued the Pirate Bay facilitated massive piracy. Defense argued it was just a search engine. Between 2006 and 2009, investigators had documented every server relocation, every domain change, every operational detail, they'd built a comprehensive case showing sustained copyright facilitation. The four founders had turned down offers to sell the site for millions. Now, they faced prison and financial ruin. April 17, 2009, all four were found guilty. Each received one year in prison. They were ordered to pay 30 million Swedish kroner in damages, approximately $3 million total. The judge stated the defendants had, quote, facilitated copyright breaches by providing a website with search functions and easy uploading and downloading. But the platform kept running during the trial and after conviction. Swartholm appealed and got bail. International pressure mounted. The United States wanted extradition. Authorities monitored communications. He realized he couldn't stay in Sweden. 2010, he chose Cambodia. Phnom Penh had no extradition treaty with Sweden. He arrived late that year rented an apartment, and managed infrastructure remotely. For approximately two years, it worked. Investigators knew generally where he was, but couldn't touch him. 2011. Prosecutors found leverage. They convinced Cambodia that Swartholm had committed additional crimes beyond the Pirate Bay, hacking allegations involving Swedish and Danish companies. Cambodia wanted good European relations. 
they agreed to cooperate. The net was closing. September 2012, Cambodian police surrounded an apartment in Phnom Penh. Swedish authorities provided intelligence. Interpol issued a red notice. The charges included alleged hacking against Logica, a Swedish IT company, and CSC, a Danish firm. When officers entered, they found Swartholm on his laptop. He tried to lock the screen, but they grabbed it first. The laptop contained encrypted communications and credentials. Authorities tried for weeks to access it. Nothing worked, but they had the person. November 2012, Cambodia put him on a plane to Stockholm. Police arrested him at the airport. September 2013, he was convicted on hacking charges. Combined with the Pirate Bay conviction, he faced years behind bars. A prosecutor told reporters the conviction sends a clear message that Sweden takes cybercrime seriously. But the real question wasn't his fate. It was whether his creation could survive without him. The Pirate Bay had operated through the 2006 raid, through his flight to Cambodia, through his arrest and imprisonment. Could it continue while its architect sat in a Swedish prison cell? They caught the man, but they couldn't catch the design. Years passed, the world changed, but the story wasn't over. December 2014, authorities raided Stockholm data centers targeting the Pirate Bay infrastructure. They removed equipment. The platform went dark. Entertainment representatives called it finished. February 2015, the Pirate Bay reappeared online. Different servers, same content. The architecture survived without its creator. September 2015, Svartholm was released from prison. He avoided interviews and largely disappeared from public view. The platform kept running without him. By 2025, analysts observed that the streaming landscape has fractured dramatically. Every major studio launched its own platform. Watching everything legally requires multiple subscriptions costing over $100 monthly. The convenience that killed piracy in the 2010s has vanished. Industry data shows piracy platforms saw over 216 billion visits in 2024, a 66% increase from 2018. The methods evolved but followed Svartholm's core principles. Security experts identified Telegram as a leading source of pirated content, a violation of copyright law in most jurisdictions. The messaging app's encryption lets users share movies hours after release. Though such distribution remains illegal, Indonesian authorities arrested two administrators in 2024 for allegedly distributing copyrighted content through Telegram channels. Telegram blocked over 15 million groups, channels, and bots in 2024, but more kept appearing. Streaming rippers, software that illegally copies content, pull video directly from Netflix and Disney servers, bypassing protection systems designed to prevent unauthorized distribution. Decentralized networks spread content across thousands of computers worldwide. Research suggests piracy now accounts for about a quarter of global internet traffic in North America, Europe, and Asia. Hollywood faces projected losses of $13 billion by 2027. The distributed model Svartholm designed influenced more than piracy. WikiLeaks used similar server distribution to survive government pressure. Darknet markets adopted the architecture. Even legitimate services studied how the pirate base survived coordinated attacks. Rivals that seemed stronger in 2008, Kick-Ass Torrents, RRBG, eventually fell. The pirate bay outlasted them all. Media coverage from 2024 notes that the pirate bay remains one of the most resilient torrent sites 21 years after launch. It still ranks in the top 10 most visited torrent sites as of 2025, operating through proxy sites and nearers. It's blocked in over 20 countries, including the UK, Germany, France, and Australia. Frederick Ney served his sentence and moved to Laos. Peter Sunday became a privacy activist. Carl Lundstrom returned to business, and Gottfried Svartholm disappeared. Probably watching Piracy's 2025 return, knowing he helped build foundations that outlived his involvement, 
Understanding this case matters for cybersecurity professionals, policymakers, and digital rights advocates navigating the ongoing tensions between copyright enforcement, free information principles, and the practical limits of centralized control in decentralized networks. The architecture remains. The network persists. It went dark once in 2006. It came back three days later. 20 years on, it still hasn't stayed dark since. As of 2025, the Pirate Bay remains online. This case remains one of the most studied examples of how technology can outlast the institutions that try to control it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Arxis for more deep dives into the world's biggest cyber crimes. Check out this next investigation and let me know in the comments what hackers we should cover next.